from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see that we have a capacity crowd here, and um, we'll be uh, sorting out seating in the background and, and bringing in available chairs. It's great to have this level of turnout for this program. My name is Eric Eldrich. I'm an EEO specialist in the Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance, and I work as the, the library's ADA coordinator. We're very glad to have everyone here today, uh, especially employees from <coughs> the Library of Congress Deaf Association, and employees from the Organization of Employees with Disabilities. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, the director of OIC, uh, Naomi Earp. Good morning. I am overwhelmed. First of all, Dr. and Mrs. Maurer, let me thank you for being here today. I am so happy to have you here. And Dr. Deanna Markham, thank you for this partnership. I just want to make a couple of really brief remarks and then I'm going to leave because I am in the middle of interviewing mediators today. I've been with the library for seven months. My first week or so on the job, the library ran a program called Judaic Law and Sharia Law. I saw the posters in the hall and I thought, oh my gosh, that would be so exciting if I had time to actually go and hear what was going on. My third week on the job, there was a lecture on Sikhs, the culture and religion of Sikhs, which a lot of people see and confuse with Islam or being Arabs. In discussing with Eric Eldridge my excitement about all the programs the library offers, Eric said, oh, the library does diversity 24-7. I thought, as Eric can be, he was just being glib. <laughs> After six months on the job, it is absolutely clear to me that the library does diversity 24-7. And one of the things that I've wanted to do is figure out a way to connect the dots between what we do in equal opportunity and what goes on broadly in the library. So I am so happy to have this program begin that process of connecting the dots and our partnership with the directorates. I would also share with you that during Disability Awareness Month in October, we ran four programs. Every week there was some program focused on something associated with disability, either reasonable accommodation, accommodation, what the law requires. Our largest audience was about 40 employees. I think what we see this morning is not only the beginning of a renaissance or maybe a revolution, but what I think it shows is what can happen when top leadership is committed. The library is a wonderful place, and I am just absolutely delighted to have this opportunity of connecting the dots. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Dr. Maurer. Enjoy the talk. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Naomi, very much um, for all of the work your office has done to help us put this program together. I want to welcome all of the visitors from uh, the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, we have several here from Baltimore. We're delighted to have all of you and to welcome all of the library staff. It's particularly gratifying to me that um, there are about 50 NLS staff here this morning, and uh, Kurt, thank you very much for making those arrangements to make sure uh, they are, are able to attend this program. The Library of Congress has been concerned about making information resources accessible to the blind and visually impaired communities for a long time. Beginning in 1931, with the passage of the Pratt-Smoot Act, we established a national library program administered by the Library of Congress that is today the National Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. 
This organization provides reading materials for nearly 800,000 Americans, including Americans who live abroad. And we're very proud of that program and what it has accomplished. We've also thought about our blind and visually handicapped users who come to the Library of Congress. And we have, uh, working with Eric Eldridge and others, tried to make accommodations so that our resources are more available to them as well. And in our Humanities and Social Sciences Division, we have workstations that are set up to meet their needs. And we have staff who are uh, particularly anxious to help meet their needs. Our web conferences that are handled by the digital reference section uh, use something called online programs for all that are easily accessible to anyone with a screen reader. And these programs are designed to be accessible by all, as in its name, online programs for all. And just yesterday, uh, there was an LC-led session about how to use Thomas, our uh, website for legislative information, that was facilitated by a law librarian and a digital reference librarian, just one example of our efforts to make our materials and our services more accessible. The Copyright Office, which is part of the Library of Congress, has spent a lot of time over the years looking at ways to improve access to copyrighted works for blind and visually impaired. Um, there is a lot of information on the website about what the Copyright Office is doing, but I just want to mention that in, um, in the past year, we have had two public comment proceedings and a full day meeting devoted to these issues. And we're very pleased that Dr. Mark Maurer and other representatives for the National Federation of the Blind have participated fully in all of these initiatives. And because the library has this commitment to increasing access for all, uh, we are especially pleased that Dr. Mark Maurer has agreed to talk with us today. Dr. Mark Maurer has been an entrepreneur, an automobile mechanic, an attorney in both government and private practice, and active in civic and political affairs. In Kansas City in 1986, the Convention of the National Federation of the Blind elected Dr. Maurer as president by resounding acclamation, and he has served in that capacity ever since. An important companion in Dr. Maurer's activities and a leader in her own right is his wife, Patricia, and we're very happy to have her here today as well. Dr. Maurer graduated uh, cum laude from the University of Notre Dame, and he has a Doctor of Jurisprudence from Indiana University. We welcome you, Dr. Maurer, to the library, and we thank you for your tireless support of our efforts to make information resources widely accessible to Americans. And we appreciate all the good work you do, and we look forward to your remarks. One step over. There you are. I want to thank you, Dr. Markham, for the invitation. I want also to thank you for your willingness to work with us to contemplate bringing accessibility to the works of intellectual property here at the library. Advertising in the 1960s in support of college education contained a line that I have always remembered, which said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Stephen Jay Gould, the American paleontologist said, I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. 
it seems to me that the point of education is not so much to teach somebody something, transferring knowledge from the informed to the uninformed, as it is to stimulate curiosity and the excitement of discovery in the minds of those being taught. A book is a dull object until the cover is opened, and some of them don't change with the event. <laughs> However the others do, and the excitement, the thrill, and the joy that is stimulated change the people who do the opening. I first became acquainted with books so long ago that I don't remember how I became aware of them. Before I entered school, my mother would read to me. I learned about bears. They lived in houses, slept in beds, <laughs> sat on chairs and ate porridge, a substance something like oatmeal, I was told. They were friendly to people. Even then, these things seemed to me to be unlikely, but I was curious about what part of the story might be true. Later, I came to understand that if you want to know something, you can look it up in the library. The library might not know everything, but it knew an awful lot. It had even more information than my father. <laughs> when I entered the second grade, I had learned to read Braille. I was authorized, authorized is indeed the right word, to borrow Braille books from the school library at the School for the Blind. The librarian would not lend me some books because she said they were too old for me. I wondered what the mysterious knowledge was that I could not be permitted to have because of my age. I still wonder, but not nearly as much as I used to. Later, I learned about the Library for the Blind in Iowa. I had visited many libraries and I had admired them. However, they were not easy for me to use and despite the aura of hidden knowledge that pervaded them, they were mu not much fun. The Library for the Blind was different for me. I could read any book that struck my fancy. From that time to this, the Library for the Blind has remained an important bright spot in my life. During high school, during college, during law school, during the time that I have practiced law, and during the time that I have led the National Federation of the Blind, one of my primary efforts has been to obtain access to reading material for myself, for my blind colleagues, for blind college students, for senior blind people and for blind children. One element of participation in society is the ability to get at and use information. The resource of knowledge contained in books is a vital part of this information, probably the most vital part. We in the National Federation of the Blind have been working diligently to be a part of the growing digital age. Computers became important before I entered college in the early 1970s. I remember attempting to master this new technology. One of my colleagues in the National Federation of the Blind modified an early computer printer which printed matter on paper tape. He put a piece of elastic under the paper tape and programmed the computer that drove the printer to present the results of computer calculations by having the period incorporated within the printer produce feelable dots on the paper tape in the form of braille characters. Many, many generations of computer technology have passed since those days. And with each generation, we develop mechanisms to increase access for the blind to the information produced through the computers. Today, the most common form of output from a computer is an image on a visual display. However, the early computers had no such screens. The output was contained on magnetic tape, paper tape, paper printouts, or computer cards. Many people have suggested that computer presentation is inherently visual. 
It is visual only because it has been built that way. It is inherently based on computer code which can be represented in many ways. On May 11, 2009, I observed from a distance of three miles the launch of the space shuttle headed into Earth orbit to conduct repairs on the Hubble telescope and to build enhancements into it. The images received from the Hubble telescope are more often digitization, created representations than visual reproductions. The range of wavelengths of scientifically gathered information exceeds that observable by the eye although most of the images reproduced appeal to the visual sense. The Hubble itself is often a non-visual observer. I understand that the visual image of a shuttle heading into space is dramatic and impressive, but as I stood in Florida observing the launch, the sound impressed me, but even more, the influence upon my being by the multiple levels of vibration told me that power was being expended at an enormous rate. I was part of a group observing the launch because the National Federation of the Blind had made a presentation to NASA officials about the urgent need for blind people to gain literacy and two coins produced by the United States Mint in honor of the 200th birthday of Louis Braille were aboard the shuttle. These coins incorporate real, tactile, readable Braille. I have them with me here. They represent the dream of an entire class of human beings to gain access to knowledge and to use it to expand the horizons that have limited the future for us all. In 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was adopted. Sometime later, regulations to implement the act became effective. Included within them are provisions requiring that automated teller machines be built to provide non-visual access for their use. The manufacturers of the ATM said that the banks were not purchasing machines with non-visual access characteristics. Consequently, the manufacturers were not building them. The bank said that the manufacturers were not producing <laughs> the machines incorporating non-visual access. So, they could not purchase them. Inaccessible bank machines were nobody's fault, they all said. Inaccessibility was caused by an unfortunate set of unchangeable circumstances we viewed the standoff with outrage. When the National Federation of the Blind had sued a sufficiently large number of people, <laughs> non-visual access standards became a priority for manufacturers. <laughs> In 2002, the Help America Vote Act became law. One part of this law is a requirement for non-visual access characteristics to be built into voting machines. Polling places supported with federal dollars were required to have them installed by 2006. I admit that it feels remarkably good to be able to cast a secret ballot. It had never happened for me until after the non-visual access systems became a part of the voting process. A few years ago, the Google company announced that it was forming partnerships with some of the major libraries of the world to create digital versions of the collections they housed. Google would be using the vast array of material collected to permit users of its system to conduct searches of literature. By doing these searches, Google users could identify books that they might want to read. The National Federation of the Blind was fascinated by this announcement. Google was planning to make snippets of its material available. Why, we wondered, along with the rest of the world, could not all of it be made available? 
Why could we not get our hands on the books themselves? The libraries have them in print, but the digitized versions could easily be rendered by computer-created voice or on a computerized braille display. With a tiny amount of reflective thought, the programming staff at Google could offer blind people throughout the United States and beyond our borders access to millions of books. Although doing the necessary work to make it practical struck us as daunting, the prospects of what might happen when the work was done were also sufficiently captivating that they were virtually equivalent to a physical sensation. The prospect of being able to get at this much information with ease and speed is nothing short of joyous. We began an odyssey to meet with the heads of the libraries whose collections were being digitized. One of the benefits of this digitization project was that the material would be made available to the universities that had permitted Google to digitize it. Students and staff at such universities would be permitted to use the digitized collection. We pointed out that creating a digitized version for sighted students and staff that did not incorporate non-visual access for blind students and staff would violate the law. We urged the librarians to insist upon equal access for their print-disabled borrowers. In the meantime, the Authors Guild sued Google to make it stop the digitizing process, arguing that creating a digitized version of a print book violates the copyright law. The case is in the midst of settlement negotiations which are very likely to become final within the next few months. When the Google settlement was first announced, equal access for the blind and otherwise print disabled was indeed a part of the agreement. Google has two years from the time the settlement becomes final to devise and implement a method for providing equal access to the blind and print disabled. The National Federation of the Blind predicted some time ago that electronic book reading systems would soon be widely available. The Amazon company released the Kindle 2 early in 2009. The Kindle 2 had a text-to-speech program in it which could take a text document and make it hearable. We in the National Federation of the Blind were not surprised because we had urged Amazon to incorporate speech programs in its products. We were, however, disappointed that the controls of the device were not accessible to the blind, making the Kindle 2 unusable except with vision. Shortly after the release of this new reading system, the Authors Guild demanded that the speaking program component be switched off for books sold through Amazon to be used with this product. The authors were making the argument that a hearable version of intellectual property is a violation of copyright because it is a taking without permission of the visual version of the book and producing that book in an alternate format. We of the National Federation of the Blind responded that access to intellectual property is not limited to the visual realm. Reading can be done visually, auditorily, or tactily. We urged that the authors permit auditory presentation of their books. Later in 2009, Amazon announced that one version of the Kindle would be deployed on college campuses in a number of places throughout the United States. We asked the colleges not to deploy inaccessible technology in their classes. 
When they ignored this request, we asked the Department of Justice to investigate the legality of such practices. The Department of Justice has announced that several universities have indicated that they will not be using inaccessible technology in their courses. We urge electronic book producers to realize that if they produce material that can be heard as well as seen, the market share available to them increases. It is estimated that between 15 and 30 million Americans are print disabled, some or all of the time. Sometimes the print disability consists of the inability to hold a book for long periods. Sometimes the print disability is blindness. Other causes exist. In 2001, the National Federation of the Blind began construction of a new building, the National Federation of the Blind Jernigan Institute. At that time, we contemplated the possibility of building a handheld portable reading machine for the blind. We joined with Ray Kurzweil, the inventor and futurist who had built the first reading machine for the blind to pursue this project. The first version of this machine was released in 2006. The smallest reading for machine for the blind in the world, the KNFB Reader Mobile, is a software program that operates nowadays on a cell phone. Some of the underlying technology required to build a portable handheld reading machine has been redesigned into a software product that will offer people the opportunity to read electronic books. This new software device, the BLEO, which is to be released for free public use in the next few weeks, was demonstrated as one of the most exciting new technologies during the keynote speech at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada in early January. The BLEO is expected to have accessibility built into it at the time of its release. It is also believed that this software product will offer access to several million electronic books at or shortly after the date of its release. In September of 2008, the National Federation of the Blind, the Apple Corporation, and the state of Massachusetts released an agreement. One of the most widely used technologies for music, iTunes, had been unusable by blind individuals. Apple said that it would undertake to provide non-visual access to iTunes, the iTunes Store, and iTunes U, an element of the iTunes program used for access to university material. When the next version of the iPhone was released in 2009, this device incorporated non-visual access technology even though the product was built as a flat screen system without a keyboard. When the iPod Touch was manufactured by Apple, it also contained non-visual access. Apple computers, iPhones, and iPod Touches have accessibi accessibility built into them from the manufacturer. Equal access, regardless of visual ability, is the standard. Dr. Deanna Markham, Associate Librarian for Library Services of the Library of Congress, delivered an address in China in September of 2009. In her talk, she said that the Library of Congress would be one of a number of libraries to create the World Digital Library. When I read this, it stirred my excitement. I have joined with others in blindness organizations throughout the United States and the world to seek ways of promoting and sharing accessible digital information. Dr. Markham indicated that equal access would be a standard to be sought 
through the World Digital Library, the dream of librarians to make information available regardless of the wealth of the person to get it, regardless of the origin or birth of the person, and regardless of the social standing of that person was demonstrated by Dr. Markham. Let the intellect manage the intellectual property. Limit the minds of those doing the reading or the research only by the capacity of those minds. Let knowledge be available to everybody. This reminded me of the declaration of the generous individual who endowed the Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore. When the library was being opened in 1886, he said, for 15 years, I have studied the library question and wondered what I could do with my money so that it could do the most good. I soon made up my mind that I would not found a college for a few rich. My library shall be for all, rich and poor, without distinction of race or color. I realize that Mr. Pratt did not include the blind, but he did not because he did not know how to include the blind. Today, we know all that we need is the recognition that the blind must be a part of the included group and the will to ensure that it is done. From those to whom much is given, much is expected. Even the Bible says that to those that have, more shall be given. The blind have been given short shrift most times, most places. The opportunity exists today for us to gain access to much, perhaps most, of the intellectual property that has been collected in the libraries of the world. We are asking that plans be made so that all of us can use this magnificent resource. The Library of Congress is recognized throughout the world and revered by those who cherish knowledge. I myself have spent time in the stacks of the law library and have conducted research that helped to change the lives of blind workers in America. As the library pursues the creation of a worldwide body of information made available to people through the newest technologies, we are asking that the plans incorporate non-visual access for the blind and print disabled. As we contemplate the intellectual property represented by such a resource, we will build upon it and create additional intellectual property. Furthermore, we understand that if we have this resource available to us, you will be able to demand more of us than has been true of times gone by. We believe that we have done good work. Our dreams and our efforts have helped to bring you the BLEO. However, we want very much to have the opportunity to contribute more to our society than we have been able to build to date. The Library of Congress, which has been such a magnificent leader in protecting and defending intellectual property and making it available for use by scholars and others can lead once again in this spectacular effort. I look forward to working with you in making it happen. And I thank you for inviting me.
Thank you, everyone. We have uh, time for a few questions, and uh, we want to uh, make sure that people get a chance to see the exhibit in the lobby uh, about the Louis Braille exhibit. Uh, if you're not able to spend time uh, to see that uh, today, uh, know that uh, there is a version of the Louis Braille exhibit online, and there's also an exhibit online about uh, diversity and disability to, uh, that features the Library of Congress collections. Uh, at this point, uh, would uh, we'll, be, we'll be entertaining questions from the audience, and I'll be repeating them uh, for the microphone. Any questions? Yes. Could you tell us the website where we can find the Louis Braille exhibition? The Library of Congress's website is www.loc.gov, and in the library's search uh, uh, bar, then you can put in Louis Braille Exhibition, and it will take you directly to the page, where it'll give you a list and you'll, you'll have that connectivity. The same for the disability and uh, diversity display. Yes? I'm just curious about the video link, what the electronic book would be on it. Are there some things that are going virtually, or um, anything you own about a Kindle store? Uh, Dr. Marr, the question is uh, about uh, the Blio and uh, its connections with Amazon and, and other corporations. The Blio is a product that will be distributed by um, major distributors of um, consumer products. It will be given away. It is a software product. It, uh, however, will urge you to buy books from book makers, book uh, producers, distributors, and these are electronic books. The Blio will run on several different platforms, a computer, a cell phone, um, at least those, and uh, maybe on others. I, I don't know the full list of them. There are agreements with um, places like um, Walmart that will uh, have books that you can buy and the Blio will come with them. Other questions? Yes. Is the Blio, is that an audio format or? Uh, the question is about the Blio. Could you describe more about it? Is it an the, auditory format? How does it work? The Blio is a software product. It provides a visual impression of a book, but it also has audio characteristics built into it so that if you want an auditory version of the book, you can get it. There are complexities with the authors who are worried about their um, recordings of their books. They say that making an auditory version of it is somehow a taking, which strikes me as crazy. I've been reading audio books <laughs> my whole life, but they, some of them, worry about that, so there will have to be some complexities. Supposing that the authors permit it, anybody who gets a print book can also get an audio book. Now, uh, that is to say, you get, it in, you get it in computerized speech. You get it both ways, and you get it out of the box both ways. Um, and there are controls in the Blio so that you can use it as a, a, either a visual or an audio device at the same time. But right now it will be in computerized speech? Yes, it will be in computerized speech. If the book comes out as a visual product along with an audio product, the Blio will have the capacity to present both. So if you're buying a product that is a dual dual produced product, you can do it that way. Dr. Mara, uh, I have a question. Uh, we have the NFB um, uh, pocket uh, Kurzweil machine, the portable machine. We purchased it for the Assistive Technology Demonstration Center that we use internally here. Um, you've said that there are newer versions. Could you describe the, the, the newer features of the newer version? Well, there is a newer version of the device depending on when you bought it, that is, um, I was told in December that very shortly I'd have a new product and it would have some new characteristics. I'm not sure that they're all 
um, out in the public yet, so I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell anybody. Uh, Can you give us a hint or two? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see. Uh, I, one small hint about one of the characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, some blind people who are totally blind have trouble figuring out whether their socks match. This machine will help you know that. <laughs> Great. And uh, I, I would ask you to uh, explain your demonstration center. Uh, Mike Handy of ITS and I were able to come to your demonstration center. Your staff, Ann and West, were, were wonderful. And um, could you explain what your demonstration center is and does? The National Federation of the Blind has the International Braille and Technology Center for the Blind, which is a collection of all of the hardware and software products produced anywhere in the world to provide access to information for the blind. We have uh, lots and lots of computers in there. There are 16 ways that we know of, or there were the last time I counted, to use a computer to get on the internet. And they're different ways. They're not all the same. So there are 16 companies that have built a mechanism that you can use to let you search the web using a computer. Some of them are better and some of them are not so better. But um, they are all there, and any product that's made anywhere in the world that's a commercially viable product. We don't put prototypes on display, but anything that is produced commercially and that you can lay your money out to buy, we have there, and also we have some of the material that we've done ourselves. We operate a Newsline for the Blind program. That program provides 300 newspapers on a daily basis over the telephone or by computer to individuals who are blind who want them. And uh, also today, nine different magazines can be uh, received by that program. And the Library of Congress, National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped has been generous in providing the magazines that we put onto the Newsline system, or at least some of them. And so thank you very much, Mr. Silty. <laughs> Um, thank you for entertaining questions, and at this time for a wrap-up, I would uh, turn to Dr. Markham. Dr. Maurer, thank you for a really wonderful presentation. And on behalf of the Library of Congress and the librarian, Dr. Billington, I can assure you that we are anxious to work with you and find ways to increase access for all. And at this time, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And if you haven't yet seen the Louis Braille exhibit that's just outside, um, in the lobby. I hope you'll take a moment to tour the exhibit. Eric Eldridge will lead tours, and we're delighted um, to make this presentation to all of you before it goes away. It's, uh, the, the exhibit is scheduled uh, to come down at the end of January, so do take a moment to see it. Thank you very much for being here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.